Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> I hate to interrupt the conversation. <laughs> So I'm Paul Dittman. I'm with Compere Financial. Uh, Compere is part of the, the National Farm Credit System. Farm Credit System has been around since 1916. It was actually set up by the federal government because farmers at the time didn't have access to reliable, affordable credit. So we're a government-sponsored enterprise, technically, although there's no government money in our system at this point. Um, Compere Financial covers three states. We're in about two-thirds of Wisconsin, the eastern half of Minnesota, and the northern half of Illinois. Um, we've been in existence as Compere for about six and a half years. Prior to that, um, I was with Badgerland Financial, which was the farm credit in southern Wisconsin. We went through a merger with two other farm credits to form Compere. But, um, but as I say, the system's been around for more than 100 years. My specific role with Compere, I run our Emerging Markets Loan Program. So it's a loan program for farmers who market their products directly to consumers or do something with value-added agriculture. And we consider organic to be value-added. We consider managed grazing to be value-added, other regenerative practices. So we work with a lot of different types of farm operations. We started that program um, at the time of the merger, which again is six and a half years ago. We had zero in the portfolio. Uh, right before COVID, we had about $3 million in our portfolio, and today we're over $30 million. So it's, it's growing really quickly. And there's a, up until three months ago, we had two uh, loan officers working in the program. Now we've got a third in Illinois. So I'm going to talk a little bit about organic far financing and programs. Maybe share a little bit more of my background. So I've been with Farm Credit for 12 years. Uh, prior to that, I ran the Wisconsin Farm Center here at the, the Wisconsin Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, which is the Farmer's Assistance Center there. Before that, I was a county ag agent for quite a few years. Been involved in organics since the mid-90s. I went to my first Moses, actually it wasn't even called the Moses Conference back then, it was the Upper Midwest Organic Farming Conference uh, at Cincinnati. Um, that was back in 1994, and I've never missed one since. So I've been, been very, uh, very involved in organics for many, many years. I was on the board of Moses for a long time and uh, have done a bunch of other stuff with organic farms. So I'm going to talk about organic financing and programs, not just ours, but all sorts of lending programs, what kind of loans there are, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk first about some basic information about farm loans and how farm loans are different than consumer loans. Um, I'll talk about the difference between regulated lenders and unregulated lenders. Our system is regulated, our, our federal regulator is the Farm Credit Administration out of Washington, D.C. Uh, banks are regulated lenders, but there are a number of unregulated lenders that have jumped into regenerative and organic finance in the last few years. I'm sure you've heard of, of a number of these organizations, and so we'll talk about the differences in those two systems. Um, I'm going to talk about how to get ready to apply for a farm loan. So if you've never taken a farm loan or you've been a conventional farmer and now you're transitioning to organic, uh, the sorts of things that you want to come to the, to the lender with, whether it's us or any other lender. Um, I'll talk about how a lender processes a farm loan application. So kind of peel back the curtain and show you how we look at things once you bring it in. And then um, I'll talk about the broader range of farm financing options. I'll, we've got uh, a tax lease program that we use for specific um, situations. I'll talk a little bit about how that works. And then finally, I'm going to open it up. Any questions that you've ever had for a farm lender that maybe you didn't want to ask your own lender um, or any other lender, ask them here. I'm happy to talk about anything you might want to talk about. And by the way, feel free to stop me at any point. If you have a question, if there's something that, um, that I'm saying that didn't make sense, you can step up to the microphone or just shout out your question. I'll repeat it. It's, this session's being recorded. So. Um, so the first thing, farm loans are commercial loans. They're not consumer loans. So if you hear on the radio that a 30-year fixed rate mortgage right now is at 7.5%, on a commercial loan, it's going to be about a percent, percent and a half higher than that. So um, commercial loans are considered to be riskier than, than or um, com yeah, commercial loans, excuse me, are um, considered to be riskier than consumer loans. There, uh, there aren't the kind of safeguards for borrowers. We have a little bit in our system in the regulated side, but um, there aren't as many um, safeguards for borrowers as you would have on the consumer lending side. There's a lot more rules and regulations on the consumer lending side. When I first started with Farm Credit, I could do consumer and commercial loans. We split that apart at the time of the merger, and so I no longer do any consumer loans. At first, I didn't like the fact that I wasn't able to do consumer loans, so I couldn't, I couldn't make a loan on a farm house, but I could make a loan on farm land. Um, but the longer we've gone along, I'm so happy that I don't have to deal with the, the regulatory side on, on uh, consumer lending. Um, 
Farm real estate loans in general can't be sold off on the secondary market. So you probably know, or maybe you know, that home loans, consumer home loans, 90 to 95 percent of those loans end up being sold on the secondary market. So you may take a loan with your local bank, it's being serviced by your local bank, you think that the local bank holds that loan, but as soon as you close that loan, they turned around and sold it on the secondary market to Freddie or Fannie. And it's just transferring the risk. It's not, it's, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to be selling loans off on the secondary market. It does transfer the risk from your local bank onto the, the secondary market. Um, and that's why they can offer lower rates and, and offer a 30 year fixed rate mortgage on a home. Um, but on the farm lending side, we typically don't sell the loans off onto the secondary market. Um, because of that, some banks and credit unions will not write a farm loan at all. They don't want to take on the risk because they can't sell it off. They have to hold that, that loan in-house. And if the loan goes bad, it's, it's hit, it hits that institution 100%. So, um, so there are some banks and credit unions that absolutely won't write farm loans. There are a number of banks and credit unions here in Wisconsin. We've got Westby Co-op Credit Union, which is a really strong ag lender. Um, so we do have banks that are, are really good in ag lending in addition to the farm credit system. Um, but there are some that just don't touch it. Um, most banks that do offer farm loans will typically only offer a three to five year adjustable rate mortgage. So a three to five year adjustable rate mortgage, a three year adjustable rate, that would say that the loan, when you, when you take that loan out, the rate will be locked for three years. At the end of three years, it floats to whatever the, the market rate is at that point. So for a long time, that wasn't a big deal because interest rates were low and had been pretty flat. But you know, in the last two years, interest rates have more than doubled. So if you had taken a three-year adjustable rate mortgage three years before interest rates doubled, all of a sudden, you're paying 4%, now you're paying 8%. You know? So there is a risk um, when you take a three- or five-year adjustable rate. Um, our institution, we actually write a lot of 30-year fixed rate mortgages. In fact, I rarely ever write anything other than a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Um, even now, when interest rates are relatively high, there isn't a big spread right now between a three to five-year adjustable rate and a 30-year fixed. It's a relatively narrow spread at this point. Um, but I almost never write a, a three or five-year adjustable because if I do a 30-year fixed, we have something called a conversion option on our loans where a person, if rates start to come down over time, a person can pay a $300 conversion fee, convert to the lower interest rate, and then the rate's locked at that lower rate for the, the remaining term. And then if after another year, if rates go down again, they could do another conversion, keep lowering the rate over time, ratchet it down over time. So that's why I almost never write a three or five year. The only time I write a three or five year is if I know that the person's gonna pay it off within the three or five years, You know, if they're planning to sell the property or something. Um, as I mentioned, interest rates on farm loans typically are one to one and a half percent higher than a, on a consumer home loan. So just to be aware of that. And then I'll talk some more about options as we go along. So there's basically three types of farm loans. So there's operating loans, there's intermediate term loans, and then there's long-term loans. Operating loans, um, typically they're used to cover operating expenses. So we usually will set those up. The first time that we write an operating loan with someone, we usually set it up as a one-year um, loan with a single payment at maturity. So the payment is, is only due at the end of the, le of the loan term. Um, you can pay it off earlier than that. There's no problem with that. But there's no scheduled principal and interest payments. So you just you'd use it when you need it, and you pay it off when you can. So um, we like to see it paid off completely. Theoretically, it's supposed to be paid off completely because it's supposed to be paid with operating income. Um, do loans get paid off completely in one year? Not very many do, and we end up rolling them over. But we at least want to see that, that the loan balance goes up and down over time, that it's, it's revolving as it's supposed to. Um, yeah, it's, uh, typically it's a revolving line of credit. We do sometimes write what's called a declining balance, where we may say, okay, you have $100,000, and if you use 10, now you're down to 90. Even if you pay that 10 back, you only have 90 available. It's, that's not very common that we do that, but usually it's a revolving line of credit. Um, the interest rate on an operating loan is variable, so it can change on a monthly basis. If, and it typically follows the, Fed, uh, the federal funds rate. So if you hear that the Fed raised rates by a quarter percent, our interest rate is typically gonna, gonna go up about a quarter percent the following month on the operating loan. And it goes the other direction too. It'll go down on a monthly basis if, if the Fed starts to lower rates. Um, the Fed decided this week they're not lowering rates, um, or didn't lower rates at this meeting that they just had. Um, they indicated they probably wouldn't lower rates before May. And then we got the jobs report yesterday 
jobs were, job creation was twice what they were anticipating. And, and so now the bond market, which is really setting the longer term rates, is saying we don't expect that the Fed's going to start dropping rates till June. So, uh, so I think we're kind of stuck in this higher interest rate environment for a while. I want to uh, mention one other thing that we do under operating loans. So even though operating loans typically are used for operating um, expenses and are paid off with operating income, an exception to that is we do a lot of um, gap financing of grants with an operating loan. So if you've got an EQIP grant or you've got a regional conservation partnership program grant or value-added producer grant or any, any other grant that's reimbursable where you have to pay out the expenses and then you have to apply for reimbursement, we do operating loans to cover that. Um, it's kind of a nice way of doing it because like with an EQIP project, you might have $50,000 that you pay out to contractors and then you turn around and ask NRCS for reimbursement and it may take a month, month and a half for the reimbursement to come in. You can use your operating loan to pay the contractor. You apply for reimbursement. When you get the reimbursement, you pay off the operating loan, and then you're only paying interest for a month or two. You know, so it's kind of a nice way of, of doing things. Um, we've even uh, done operating loans. I, I've been working with a group of limited resource farmers. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, the question is, um, I mentioned reimbursable grants, yeah. that we can do gap funding for that, but what about a grant where you have to provide a 50% match? Or like value-added producer grant, it'll help your application if you show that you've got a line of credit in addition to the grant funds. Yeah, and we absolutely do that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, grants um, in our world, we love that because obviously it's it, it takes a lot of the risk out of the loan, right? Because half the project or 70% of the project, or if you're a beginning farmer, Equip will pay 90% cost sharing, right? So yeah, we love grant-funded projects. Um, the other thing with grants, too, if, if we have a client that's applying for a grant, like a value-added producer grant, or I had um, I, one of my clients call me yesterday, he's applying for, um, oh, I can never remember what the acronym is, but it's the new infrastructure grant, the Rural Food System Infrastructure Grant, is that right, RFSI? Yeah, and um, in, I'm going to write a letter of support for his grant proposal, you know, and that sometimes carries some weight if we, you know, say we're a lending institution, we support this project, we think it's going to be a good thing, not just for the farmer, but for the community. So, um, oh, I started saying, we, so we've been doing some work with, um, with limited resource farmers where they, um, they're, in this particular case, they've got RCPP contracts, so Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant contracts, which are great. It's like EQIP with a kicker on top of it. It's a, it's a really nice, I've actually got one on my own farm. Um, this group of limited resource farmers, they don't have the cash to put out to, um, to pay for the grant funded uh, expenses. Um, they also don't have any equity or any collateral to, um, to support a loan application. And so what we've done there, we've entered into assignment and payment contracts where we pay their vendors directly and then we can apply for reimbursement directly from NRCS. So, and we don't take any collateral from the farmer. The only collateral that we're using on that loan is just the contract payment. So it's kind of unusual. The first time I did one, I sent it through and our doc prep people freaked out because they're like, what are you taking as collateral here? I'm like, just the contract, no physical collateral. No, there is nothing. There's no equipment, there's nothing. So. Um, and we're able to do that. We're, we're running a little snag right now trying to get reimbursed from NRCS. That's a bit of a challenge, but, uh, but we can do it. <clears throat> so the next type of loan are inter intermediate term loans. So intermediate term loans, that's typically used to purchase equipment, um, purchase breeding livestock, movable buildings. So we can do a lot of different things with an intermediate term loan. Um, term of, of the loan is up to seven years. So we don't generally write a, a term loan for more than seven years. Um, that'll have scheduled principal and interest payments. So it'll be monthly payments or it might be quarterly or semi-annual, annual. We try to line the payments up with the cash flow of the farm. Um, this can either be a fixed interest rate or an adjustable rate. And again, I, I rarely ever write adjustable rate loans in anything because I, personally, I would want to know 
this is the interest rate I'm going to pay. I don't have to worry about three years from now interest rate going through the roof. So I almost always write fixed interest rate uh, loans on, on intermediate term. And then long-term loans be used to purchase real estate or buildings. These are up to 30 years. Um, they'll have scheduled principal and interest payments. Again, payments will be monthly or uh, quarterly, semi-annual or annual. Um, can either be fixed or adjustable. Again, almost always fixed. And then this is a program that we started a few years ago at Compeer. Um, we're, we're, you know, I work with a lot of organic farmers, and when folks are going through the transition, there's a lot of times a bit of a cash flow lag during the transition phase, especially with organic grain, especially outside of Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, we have, we have the advantage of still having a lot of livestock that need hay. And so you can put in a hay crop during the transition. It's kind of a nice way to, to still generate income as you're transitioning over. But if you're a grain producer and you don't have that option, you know, you're, you're putting inputs in, you're following organic practices, you're not getting organic premiums on your uh, commodities and that sort of thing. So there's always a cash flow lag. So we came up with this program, and it's a combination of an operating loan and a term loan. So it's an interest-only operating loan for the years of transition. So you only have to pay the interest each year. You don't have to pay any principal back. Then once you're certified organic, it switches over to a five-year term loan with regular principal and interest payments when you've got better cash flow to cover it. So, um, so it's been kind of, kind of a fun uh, thing to do. We actually haven't written a whole lot of loans under this because I, I was the one who designed this program and I kind of screwed up the design. I didn't design it very well. And our loan officers don't like using it. So I put in a little bit too much hassle for them. Like we had to put in multi-year cash flow projections, which nobody wants to do. I do them a lot with my clients, but most loan officers don't want to mess with it. So we, we still write these loans, but they just write them as, as operating loans that they just keep rolling the balance for years until uh, the person's certified organic. So that's just a little inside baseball that we actually don't write a whole lot of these loans, but we still are financing a lot of organic farms. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about um, regulated lenders versus non-regulated lenders. So as I mentioned, we're regulated lenders. We've got a federal regulator that oversee, oversees our institution. Um, banks are overseen by federal regulators as well, or state regulators, depending on how the bank is chartered. So lenders in the United States, our system, the farm credit system, is by far the largest lender to agriculture. So we hold, if you look at all the farm debt in the country, our system holds about 44% of it. And in our territory, we hold about 50% of the farm debt in a lot of our, our territory. So we're, we're by far the biggest ag lender. Um, all banks put together hold roughly 35% of all the farm debt in the country. Um, next would be individuals. So someone writes a land contract when they're selling land to a family member or something. Um, USDA Farm Service Agency, dealer financing, John Deere credit, that sort of thing. Um, insurance companies, insurance companies used to do a lot more lending than they do now, but they still, on bigger farms, they'll do uh, lending. That segment is about 20%. And then the non-regulated lenders who've come in the last few years in, in regenerative organic are less than 1% right now. So why are we regulated and these non-regulated lenders are not regulated? This is a big reason why we're regulated. It's the farm crisis of the 80s. So there aren't too many of you in here that have as much gray hair as me, but there are a few of you that probably have read about the farm crisis of the 80s. Um, really, really tough time in ag lending. Our system just about went down uh, during the farm crisis of the 80s. The, the farm credit system was in a uh, world of hurt, and the federal government came in with a pretty significant bailout. All that money was paid back with interest, by the way, so there's no federal money in our system now. The federal government didn't lose any money on our system, but the system almost imploded in the 80s. Banks were in the same situation. A lot of banks had um, went broke. There were bankers that were being shot. I mean, it was, it was ugly. It was really ugly times. Um, the first Farm Aid concert was held in the farm crisis of the 80s. I graduated from the University of Illinois. I was at that concert. It was awesome. But it didn't bode well for someone with an ag degree getting out and trying to get a job uh, in the farm crisis. So. so because of the farm crisis, a lot of things changed. Um, there are much greater borrower's rights than there used to be. So back in the old days, if your farm was upside down, and that's kind of what happened in the farm crisis, land values had escalated a lot. This, this is going to sound like a familiar story to you, some of you, because we're kind of in the same situation again. Land values escalating 10, 15, 20% a year. Um, interest rates went up a lot during the, the early 80s. Um, 
But what happened also is we lost some of our, our international markets. Of course, we had that happen a few years ago, and there's threats of it happening again, depending on the outcome of the, of the uh, election this year. Um, you lose your international markets, interest rates go up, land values have escalated like crazy, people borrowed against those escalated land values, and then all of a sudden land values drop by 50%. And so suddenly banks were upside down, lending institutions in general were upside down on a lot of loans, ended up foreclosing, the farmers were into bankruptcy, I mean it was a mess, it was a big mess. Um, and borrowers didn't have many rights, so if, if you were foreclosed, you were thrown off your farm, that farm was taken, it was sold to somebody else. Because of the farm crisis of the 80s, um, there's, like if I turn somebody down for a loan, there's a very specific process that I have to follow when I deny someone credit, and that person has the right to appeal that decision. They can appeal to our board um, and ask for a reconsideration. They didn't have that back in the old days. Um, when farms were foreclosed back in the 80s, people were thrown off the farms immediately. Now there's a redemption period. So if, you're, if you face foreclosure, once there's been a judgment of foreclosure, there's a one year redemption period. So you as a farmer can go find someone else to provide credit, pay off that lender that's, that's got the foreclosure action against you and you keep your farm. You didn't have that back in the 80s. So that, that's some of the things that changed. There's a lot more stress testing of farm loan portfolios. So we're regulated by the Farm Credit Administration at the federal level. We get our money from uh, Agribank, which is a wholesale bank in the Twin Cities. They come in and audit our books. We have internal auditors that are auditing our books. And so every so often I'll get an email saying, hey, I, I pulled this loan out of your portfolio and I noticed that this isn't in the file and that's not in the file and that's not in the file. And that's, and that's one of those things that keeps you up at night. It's like, and they usually send the message at like 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. So then I get to think about that all weekend. Like, oh my God, did I forget to put the balance sheet in that file? Um, so we're really, we have a lot of oversight. And then we have to stress test the entire portfolio. Like, what happens if interest rates double? What happens if commodity prices drop by 50%? What's gonna happen to our portfolio? Are we still gonna be around or not? So, um, so the system is much more solid and banks are much more solid than they were back then. Um, there's been creation of state level farm mediation and arbitration programs. So that was, when I was at the Farm Center, that was one of the programs in the Farm Center was the, the farm mediation arbitration program. So if a farmer is given an adverse decision by, um, by say the Farm Service Agency, you apply for a loan from, from FSA, and FSA turns you down for that loan, you've got 30 days to appeal that decision. But if you apply for mediation, it stops the clock on that appeal, and it forces FSA to come to the table with a, a trained mediator. There's no cost for the program, by the way, so you as a farmer can apply for mediation, and it doesn't have to be just FSA. It could be your bank. It could be um, a supplier that's got a judgment against you or something. You can have those people come to the table with a trained mediator and, and try to work it out so that it doesn't end up in court. Um, Farmer Mac was created in the farm crisis of the 80s. Farmer Mac is a secondary market for farm loans. Uh, we, don't, we don't use Farmer Mac. Our funding mechanism that we have for our loans is a little bit different, so we can write a 30-year fixed rate without passing the, the risk off to the secondary market. But Farmer Mac is, um, is available for banks to pass farm loans off. They typically only do that with larger loans. So if you're a smaller scale farmer, you're probably not gonna, not gonna be able to get a 30-year fixed rate because the bank's not gonna sell the loan to Farmer Mac. There's a lot of fees involved in that. And then uh, the Farm Financial Standards Council came out um, during the farm crisis of the 80s. So before the farm crisis, every lender used their own set of standards to decide whether a farm was, had strengths or vulnerabilities. The Farm Financial Standards Council is a group of professionals, they're, um, they're economics professors, they're accountants, they're lenders, um, all sorts of financial professionals. They came together and came up with a set of standards that every lender pretty much follows when it comes to farm finances. And so there's 21 different um, financial ratios that almost all of us will use determining the strengths and vulnerabilities of a farm, and that, that was a result of the farm crisis. This book over here, um, if you're a, a total nerd about farm credit, like I am, I've read this book five times, it's sitting on my desk. Um, Anatomy of an American Agricultural Credit Crisis. It's, it's a really great overview of what happened in the farm crisis of the 80s, especially on the, on the farm lending side, how we got into trouble, how we're hopefully never gonna go down that road again. So I mentioned unregulated lenders. So banks, 
farm credit system, USDA, FSA, we all have a lot of oversight. But we've got a big rise in the number of unregulated lenders that have come into regenerative and organic uh, agriculture. And they typically start with this common myth that conventional lenders are not interested in working with regenerative farmers or not interested in working with organics or not interested in working with grazers or small scale vegetable operation or whatever it is. They start with that premise. I don't think that's true. I mean, especially not true with our institution. Other farm credits probably not quite as interested in working with organics as we are, but, um, but I don't think in general it's true. Lenders are not interested in working with people who don't have good credit. And that, unfortunately, that's a situation that we do run into sometimes. And so um, these non-regulated lenders, a lot of times they're jumping in thinking that, that they're hearing from farmers, I can't get a loan because I'm organic. But it might be because maybe the balance sheet is weak or maybe there's some blemishes in their credit history or something like that. There may be other factors at play there. These unregulated lenders are not bound by the same rules that we are. And commercial lending is, it's the Wild West. They can do pretty much anything, and you are considered business owners who should be sophisticated enough to be able to sort through a contract and figure out whether it's a good deal for you or not. Um, there's no, no regulator saying we have to make sure that they're making sound lending decisions. Um, a lot of these folks are new to agriculture, and a lot are new to farm lending. Um, and a lot of them are not even from farm country. I, I had somebody contact me this week about a loan um, to take out a lender that they, they're working with out of Vero Beach, Calif or Vero Beach, Florida, who um, made them a farm loan at 20% interest, and they want to refinance it with us. And it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know why anybody would do that, but they did. And there's no law against that. If they sign the contract, they sign the contract. You know, that's, they made a decision. Um, some of these uh, organizations have pools of capital and they're under pressure to loan that money out. So they have investors that put money into the fund and they don't want the money to sit in the fund, they want it to get deployed, they want it to be lent out. And so there's some pressure to make loans that maybe we wouldn't have. You know, we don't, when we make a loan, we get the funds from our wholesale bank and there's no pressure from the wholesale bank to, we got all this money and you need to get it out the door. It's as we need it, we access it. So some of these organizations have these pools of capital and they have to get them out. Others are struggling to find the capital. So they may commit to a loan, but then they don't have the funds to back the loan and it may take months to, to um, actually fund it. Um, these lenders are often using unconventional practices. So um, there's one pretty well known, I won't mention the name, um, but they're making farm loans that are adjustable rate loans and they're interest only. So you'll never build up any equity on that loan, you're always gonna be just paying interest. So it's essentially a way of, of paying rent be, um, in a place where they can't own farmland. Like here in Wisconsin, we have pretty strict um, corporate farming laws. So a corporation can't own more, more than 640 acres. Minnesota has really strong corporate farming laws. Illinois, less so. Um, but in places where corporations can't own farmland, they can come in and make a loan at uh, interest only adjustable rate and it's essentially paying uh, paying rent on that, on your own land, essentially. Um, sometimes the loan terms don't match the collateral, you know, so we'll make a loan for real estate and it'll be a 30-year loan. Some of these organizations will make a 10-year loan on real estate, so it isn't really matching the collateral life. Um, and some are taking equity ownership interest in, in uh, borrower's farms, which I can tell you from my experience at the, at the farm center, dealing with calls on the farmer's hotline, Letting someone take an owner's equity position in your farm is a really, really risky thing to do. Or to take a loan on, under terms that there's no way you'll ever be able to meet. And it's a way for someone to get a hold of your farm at 50 cents on the dollar because they've made a loan to you, you've pledged your farm as collateral, uh, but they've set you up for failure, right? So I'm, not, uh, I'm sounding pretty negative about these unregulated lenders and I'm obviously biased because I work for a regulated lender and I, and I appreciate the safeguards in our system even if they're a hassle at times. Um, I'm just, I'm concerned of what could happen. Even if, you're, if you are with an unregulated lender and they've made a bunch of bad loans, um, if they go down, what happens to your loan? Those loans are gonna get sold off to somebody and it may not be someone who's quite as friendly to agriculture as the person you took the loan with. So you have to be really cautious working with some of these unregulated lenders. This is the worst one I've ever seen in the last 12 years of my, <laughs> my ag lending career. 
If you can't see it in the back here, this was a loan. It was a 10 month loan. Um, it was with an online lender. It's at 94% annual interest rate, 94%. And it's legal. You can do that because it's commercial loan. It's not a consumer loan. They couldn't do this on the consumer side. Um, this has to be paid back. There was a big origination fee attached to this as well. Um, if this person doesn't make the loan payments, I mean, it, they come down hard and heavy really fast. 94% interest rate. It is, again, is the worst one that I've seen. But it's legal to do this, unfortunately. Yes? How do you know if you're working with an unregulated lender versus a regulated? Yeah, so the question is, how, how do you know if you're working with an unregulated lender versus a regulated lender? I would just ask them. Um, most, of the, most of the funds that have started up in the last few years, and I'll, I've got a slide later here that'll mention a few of them, uh, most of them are not regulated. Yeah, it's pretty rare that any of them are regulated. You know, if you're working with a bank, credit union, farm service agency, farm credit system institution, those are all gonna be regulated. Um, but yeah, pretty much anybody outside of that, they're not. Did this person realize it was a 94% interest? He did, yeah. He, um, how, how, how can you need 53,000, but then you're gonna pay another 48 in interest? Yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, he, he actually came to me, he submitted a loan application, and as we were in underwriting, he said, oh, by the way, I should probably mention that I, I took another loan with this online lender because I had to buy some inputs and I needed them fast, and it was this. And then that sunk his application with us. There was just no way that we could, I mean, his cash flow just went upside down. There was no way that we could, could make a loan. Um, He's still, he's still in business. I still see him occasionally. Um, he's been through bankruptcy twice now. But, um, but yeah, he's still, he's still in business. So, all right. So that's it on that part. I'm going to talk about applying for a farm loan. So what it takes to apply for a farm loan. And start preparing yourself early. So a lot of times I'm, I'm speaking to audiences of beginning farmers. And I'll tell them, try to build and maintain a FICO score of 670 or above. It's not a hard line, 670, but if you've got a credit score of 670 or above, you're probably not gonna have too much trouble accessing credit. Um, we do make loans to people with below a 670 uh, credit score. In our program, our Emerging Markets program, we have a micro loan that's $5,000 to $75,000. We actually don't use credit score as part of our underwriting criteria in that program. And we also don't have a maximum loan to value. So a lot of times we're, we're unsecured or undersecured. We don't have enough collateral to se fully secure the loan, but it's, it's a $75,000 cap in that. Um, so we can, we can write a loan to somebody who's got a lower than 670 credit score. I've got a lot of borrowers actually in my portfolio that have zero credit score. I have a pretty significant Amish population in my portfolio. And most Amish farmers have zero credit score. They just have never had installment debt. You know, um, And that's not gonna sink them. We just have to look at things a little bit differently or a little bit more closely. I advise beginning farmers to file a Schedule F, which is profit or loss from farming. File that with your federal tax return as soon as you can. It establishes you as a farm manager. So if you decide that you wanna buy land at some point down the road and you wanna use the, the FSA Beginning Farmer Down Payment Loan Program, which is a fantastic program, by the way. Um, if you wanna use that program, you have to have three years of farm management experience. This will start you on that path. It'll establish you as a farm manager. Even if you're really small scale, maybe you got two or three hives of bees, you're selling honey, report it on Schedule F. Start filing a Schedule F. Um, Build up cash reserves. You can never have too many cash reserves. You can often have too little. You might want to think about taking a small farm operating loan early on, even if you don't necessarily need it. It starts building a credit history. So it builds a credit relationship and also starts building a credit history. So um, I write a fair number of pretty small farm operating loans, like $10,000 farm operating loans. And a lot of them in the, in the Amish community, and it's often because they don't have any credit history, they wanna start establishing a credit history because they intend to buy a farm at some point. So, um, so I'll make a $10,000 operating loan, they'll never touch it. So um, it's, that's fine, at least it establishes the relationship. Non-farm income is a strength, and grant income is a strength too, by the way. You know, so anything that's, that's gonna help your farm cash flow is, is gonna be a positive. 
So what's a lender going to need for a loan application? It's really going to depend on the size of the loan, on uh, the type of loan that you're getting, on, on the lending institution that you're applying to. So like with our micro loan, we ask for a really simple business plan, like a one to two page business plan. We ask for a balance sheet and we ask for a cash flow projection. And that's it. We don't ask for anything more than that. We don't gather tax returns. We don't gather pay stubs, nothing else, just those three documents. Um, if I'm making a real estate loan, I, I am going to need tax returns. I'm going to need a little bit more information. Um, we're almost always going to ask for a current balance sheet or personal financial statement. So a listing of everything you own and everything you owe. So that's, that's pretty much minimum that you'll need a balance sheet. Um, we like to see a, I'd like to see a projected cash flow for a year, like a month-by-month -month cash flow projection, so I can kind of see when is cash coming into the farm, when's cash going out, when are you going to be really short of cash. Uh, we'll make an operating loan to cover those cash shortfalls during the months that it looks like you're projecting they're going to be short, or we'll talk about changing up your, your operations or something to try to bring cash in at different times. Um, very simple business plan. We don't need 20, 30, 50, 100 pages. I like a business plan that's two to three pages, and I've got a little template. If anybody wants it, I'll put my contact information. It's a template that I use with our microloan borrowers that, that results in a two-page business plan, and that's all we need. I don't want somebody to spend you know, weeks agonizing over their business plan, but it, we want to see something down on paper. And then we may need three years of tax returns, depending on the loan. This is what a balance sheet looks like, just a really simple example of a balance sheet. Current assets, that's cash, anything that converts to cash, anything that's used up on the farm within a year's time. Intermediate assets, that's anything with a life of one to 10 years. And then long-term assets, land, buildings, and improvements, things like that. And then current liabilities, that's anything that's due now or that's gonna come due in a year's time. Intermediate liabilities are any loans that tie to intermediate assets. And then long-term liabilities, anything that ties to long-term assets. So that's a balance sheet. And again, I'm, I'm happy to share a balance sheet with you. This is a really, really simple business, uh, balance sheet. I've got some that are a little more complicated for, for uh, farm operations too. This is the cash flow projection I was talking about. And so this might be a kind of a typical cash flow projection for a grain operation. We're starting, there's $20,000 in the checking account on January 1st. There's no income coming in during the month of January. You got a few expenses, you're doing some repairs and maintenance, some utility uh, bills. You got to take a family living draw. So if you started with 20, you paid these bills out, you're going to end the month with 13, 4, 17 in your checking account. And then that's the beginning of February. And no income coming in, got some expenses being paid, you're ending at 98, 34. You don't really have any income until you have a crop to sell, right? November, December. So we've got the crop being sold out here but you're tapping an operating loan in here to cover all these other expenses. You're paying for seed and soil amendments and all those sorts of things. And so we like to see this kind of a projection and we're watching this bottom line, you know, and here it gets into $900, $300. Then it starts going back the other direction. And then right here is where they pay the operating loan back off and they're ending the year with that in the farm checking account. So, and this is a spreadsheet I'm happy to share with you too, by the way. So, um, and it's something, I, I've shared this with thousands of farmers and all my farmers do this, this cash, flow, uh, cash flow projection. So how does lender make a loan decision? We've got this balance sheet, we've got the cash flow projection. Anytime you hear a lender talk about ag lending, we're gonna talk about the five C's of credit and it's character, capital, capacity, collateral, conditions. I'll talk about each one individually. We put these together and that's how we make a loan decision. Character is number one and that's um, include your credit history. That's where we're pulling a credit report. We're looking at um, your experience managing a farm, what you've done to prepare yourself, um, your past work experience, your reputation, all that sort of stuff. And so it's more of the softer things combined with the credit report. And we'll use the credit report to verify debts on the balance sheet. So, so that's character. Um, second C is capital. This is the balance sheet. This is where we're, we're looking at all of your assets, all of your liabilities. We're looking at working capital, so just short-term assets, short-term liabilities. Um, looking at what things you might have available to pledge as, as collateral if you're a little light on collateral. Um, how much you'll be able to put in as a down payment, you know, all that sort of stuff. Third C is capacity, that's the cash flow. So we're, we're looking at that cash flow and saying, okay, well, you're proposing to take a loan. We're gonna plug loan payments into that cash flow projection and make sure that you don't end up negative too many months, right? 
And what we want to see, we want to see enough cash that's going to cover your operating expenses, cover your loan payments, cover, cover family living costs, and adequately cover family living costs. We don't want you to live like paupers. We don't want you to have to cancel your health insurance. We want to make sure that there's enough included in the budget um, to cover family living. Any income tax, social security liabilities, building up adequate working capital reserves, having enough cash for a rainy day, um, ability to put some cash towards replacement of machinery and buildings that are wearing out. And that's one that a lot of farmers don't really think too much about that when they build a cash flow, but we want to see it. You know, we don't want you to pay your loan back and then the roof is caving in on the barn, right? Or the tractor won't start. That doesn't do anybody any good. So we want to make sure that there's enough in there to replace stuff. And then a 15% cushion over and above. So, and that's all stuff that we calculate on our side of the table. But, um, but yeah, we want to make sure that there's enough cash for a lot of things beyond just making loan payments. The fourth C is collateral to secure the loan. So after we've done the, the first three C's and we've decided, yep, yeah, we're going to make a loan, what are we going to use as collateral to support that loan? It usually will have a maximum loan to value. So we might say, uh, you're buying a tractor, it's $100,000, we'll loan you 70% of that. So we'll loan you $70,000 on a $100,000 tractor. Um, because if you decide not to pay pay your payments, we have to take the tractor, we have to sell it, we're going to get probably less than the market value and we're going to have to pay a commission or whatever. So that's typically the way that we, <clears throat> excuse me, would look at things. Um, although, as I mentioned, our microloan, we're always undersecured. We don't have a maximum loan to value in that program. We look at the quality of the collateral. If it's real estate, it's gonna have to be based on an appraisal. That's something else that changed with the farm crisis of the 80s, by the way. Um, before the farm crisis, loan officers in the farm credit system could do their own real estate appraisals. So some, you can, yeah, you can see what kind of conflict you might have there. You know, it's like somebody needs $500,000, you go out and, and appraise the farm, and it magically appraises for $700,000, right? Yeah, hey, no problem. Um, now there's a firewall between us and the appraisal side. I can't influence the appraisal at all, so. And then finally, uh, the fifth C is conditions of loan approval. So you got enough collateral, you got the cash flow, the balance sheet looks good, your credit score is good, and we're gonna say, okay, well, we're approving the loan, here are some conditions. You know, um, we might need a professional appraisal. If it's real estate, always have to have professional appraisal. We ask for insurance to be carried if we're, um, if we're insuring buildings or, or um, equipment. The exception to that is, is when I work with the Amish community. Um, Amish do not take property and casualty insurance, but they've got something called Amish aid. So if there's a disaster, the rest of the community will come together and, and make that person whole. And they'll actually have a document that says the community commits to making this person whole and it'll be signed by the bishop and other witnesses. And so we'll get that in lieu of, of insurance. Um, title insurance, evidence of lien, you know, we'll do uh, lien search. Uh, if we need a loan guarantee, that'll be in the conditions. Who's signing? So if you've got an entity, so are you signing on behalf of the entity and personally, or are there multiple entities involved, and do we need to have people sign from all the different entities, that sort of thing. So that's it on, on the lending process. A any questions on that? Yes. I have a question about how you just said that you, know, you lend based on the appraisal of the land. So when, yeah. when there are farmers going out and paying 13000 for an acre, but it thought, or it was appraised at 8,000, does that mean he's putting up that much more other land for collateral, or how are they doing that? Yeah, the question is, um, somebody goes out and buys land for 13,000 an acre, but it appraises for eight. How are they getting a loan to buy that? Yeah, in a lot of cases, they are pledging, pledging additional land as collateral. So they may own land free and clear. They pledge that as collateral to secure the loan for that new piece of land. And it's become fairly common. Um, we still try to make sure that we're keeping the loan to value at a reasonable level. And, it, and the loan to value tends to drop as the loan gets bigger. You know, so if you were buying $300,000 worth of land, we might loan 70% loan to value. If you're buying a million dollars of land, we might only loan 60% loan to value. So we're gonna bring in enough land, other collateral, to make sure that it's not, you're not stretched so thin that if something goes wrong that you're gonna end up losing it. That's us. Non-regulated lenders don't necessarily have that, that restriction. Banks would be the same way? Banks would be the same. Yeah, they'd be pretty conservative too. And I would say we've gotten more conservative as land values have increased. Yeah, we've we've seen this story before, so we don't want to go down that road again. I've yeah. watched a neighbor in the last two years spend three million on land, and it's been thirteen thousand or above. And I've just questioned how does he get that loan? 
Yeah, yeah, he would have to be pledging additional land that's owned free and clear as collateral. So, so a couple of, I want to talk about a couple of other loan options. Um, the USDA Farm Service Agency, we partner with the USDA Farm Service Agency a lot, especially with beginning farmers. Um, they do direct loans, so they'll lend to a farmer directly, but then they also do loan guarantees. So if we have a loan that we're making, and maybe the cash flow is a little touch and go, or maybe the person's got some uh, blemishes in their credit history or something like that, we can ask for a guarantee from FSA. Um, they'll guarantee 90% of the loan amount. So if we make a $100,000 loan, they'll guarantee 90% of that. If it's a beginning farmer, they'll guarantee 95% of that. In exchange for, for um, them taking on that risk, we'll actually lower the interest rate that we're charging to the borrower because it's taken risk out of the loan. We pass that along to you because it's, it's become less risky, right? Um, we do a lot of direct loans in partnership with FSA for real estate, for beginning farmers. So they've got their 54550 program, this, this program that I mentioned here. That program, are, how many of you are familiar with FSA's beginning farmer down payment program? Okay, so a few of you are. It's, uh, it's a fantastic deal. It's, there's some limits on it, <clears throat> but you go out, you're buying a piece of ground, uh, you come up with a 5% down payment. FSA finances 45% of the purchase on a 20-year fixed rate. Right now it's at 1.5%. So 20 years fixed, 1.5%. We finance the other 50%, and it's at a reduced market interest rate because we'll ask for a guarantee on that loan. They waive the guarantee fee under this program. So I always ask for a guarantee on these. It doesn't cost the borrower anything, and I can reduce the interest rate by half a percent. Um, another thing under this program, they'll cover the cost of the appraisal. In a farm appraisal, depending on how many buildings you have, it could be $2,000, $3,000. FSA covers the cost of that appraisal. So it's a fantastic program if you've got access to it. Wisconsin, we're fortunate. Yes, sir? So if you've already bought a property and it's recent within months, is this something that you could retroactively get bought out by FSA? Yeah, that's the, ch the question is, so what if you bought a farm recently? Could you now go to FSA and say, hey, I'd like to refinance? They won't do refinancing. Yeah, it has to be at origination. And it's, it's something that has been a bit of a challenge with FSA. Their process can take quite a bit longer than our process. Um, and that's not, that's not a negative. I mean, they're just, they're very cautious about the way they do their, um, their underwriting. But if you're trying to buy land at an auction, for example, as a beginning farmer, and you have to close in 30 days, there's no way you're gonna be able to use the FSA program, right? It's just tough. Um, so yeah, but unfortunately they can't refinance. So that program, it's a great program. They also have a 50-50 loan where you don't have to have any down payment. The interest rate's a bit higher, but they'll stretch the term longer too. They'll go 30 years or they can even go 40 years if the cash flow requires it. Um, so FSA, I, I can't say enough good about them. They're really great to work with, especially in Wisconsin. We're fortunate. Not every state is the same, by the way. Um, so I do lending in three states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois. By far the best in Wisconsin by far the worst in Illinois. Uh, it's, oh God, they're just awful in Illinois. And they're nice folks, but they're just, they're, yeah, they're very understaffed. Um, if it's something unusual, you know, if it, like I'm working with small scale vegetable growers or greenhouse operations or, um, you know, grass fed livestock operation or something, they don't really know what they're looking at. And they're, they have a hard time building comfort with the cash flows and that sort of thing. So it just, really, really hard to do it in Illinois. Wisconsin, they're awesome. I mean, they look for ways to, to say yes instead of ways to say no. So, so but FSA, is, it's a good outfit. Um, I talked a lot about these, these uh, private, for-profit, non-profit lenders. These are the non-regulated lenders. Matt Agriculture, I see they've got a table in the, in the um, trade show area. They've been in business for a few years now. Um, I know those guys, I like those guys, but they're a non-regulated lender. There, and that's, if you, if you choose to go that way, and there's a place for them. I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't a time that, that, um, that you shouldn't look at them, but just be careful. Um, Iroquois Valley Farmland REIT, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them. They're out of Illinois. Uh, Propagate Ventures is another one. Farmers Business Network. Um, Replant Capital was another one. I don't think Replant Capital is even in business anymore. And two years ago, they were doing a $200 million uh, equity raise. So that's, that's one of the challenges. You wanna look for someone 
who has been in this business for a while, who understands it, who understands agriculture, and who's going to be around for a long time too. You don't want a lender that they're in regenerative agriculture now because it's kind of the cool place to be, and then five years from now they've moved on to solar. Or a lot of these came out of controlled environment agriculture, which used to be the cool place to be until last year and the year before when hundreds of millions of dollars evaporated in controlled environment agriculture. Um, most of these, again, are unregulated, so just be careful. Um, a tax lease might be an option. So this is something that I've been writing a lot more tax leases, especially in our program where we're working with really specialized sorts of operations. Can be used for buildings, equipment, uh, vehicles, grain storage, renewable energy, infrastructure, all sorts of different things. Um, there's a lower ca initial cash outlay. So under the tax lease program, we don't require a down payment. The way it works, so we'll take, um, well, I'll give you, actually, on the next slide, I'll give you an example. So I'll, uh, that'll give you a little bit more detail on this. There's no appraisal. Um, there's no mortgage. We don't take a mortgage on these, on these uh, facilities that we do. The payment on tax leases are deductible as rent while the lease is in place. So it's not a lease to own, even though it, it, it kind of is, but it's not technically from a legal standpoint. So you can write off the lease payments while the lease is in place. Um, we also do uh, sale leasebacks and we do buck out, what we call a buck out lease option. I don't write a lot of those. Um, I mostly do true tax leases. So let me give you, this is an example of, of a tax lease that I did uh, last year. So this was one of my Amish clients. He, was, he uh, runs a, a farm machinery fabrication manufacturing business and they man, he actually does a lot of other repairs. He's a, he's a HVAC technician too, which is crazy to me. I mean, he's, you know, he's fixing people's refrigeration and he's got, he doesn't even have electricity at home. But um, the guy is brilliant. I mean, he is, he is an amazing guy. Well, um, this piece of property that he's on here, I talked to him about financing it when he bought it. And it happened to be when interest rates were going up. When interest rates are rising, our system, the farm credit system, tends to be less competitive against the banks because the bank's rates don't go up as much as ours or as quickly. We're more competitive when rates are flat or when they're going down. Then we become really competitive against the banks. Well, this happened to be during a rising interest rate environment. And I'd been talking to him for several years about this project and helping him with his cash flow projections and stuff. He went to buy the land and he called me and our interest rate was like 3% higher than, than the rate the bank quoted him. And he was kind of sheepish. He's like, oh, you know, I, you, I, I, I'd like to do business with you, you know, and, but I, and I said, no, this is a business decision. 3% is a lot of money. Go with the bank. You absolutely should not come with us just because I'm a nice guy, right? <laughs> so go with the bank. And I said, by the way, as you work on your project, if you have any questions, give me a call. I'm happy to, happy to work with you. So he called me a few months later, and he said, well, I went to the bank to get a loan to put up this shop. The shop's going to cost 200000 the bank did an as-will-be appraisal and said, when this shop is built, it's going to be worth 150000 and they'll loan me 70% of the 150000 that it's appraised for. So he needs two hundred to put up the shop. The bank's going to give him one hundred and five. dollars And he said, you know, I saved, I saved up a down payment, but I didn't save up $95,000. So he said, now I'm starting to look at what I can take out of the building. And he said, the, main, the big thing I need to take out of the building is the bridge crane, which is the thing the big piece of metal there on the right-hand side picture, the lower right picture, um, he said, I'm going to have to take out my bridge crane, and if I do that, then I'm going to have to turn down this contract that I was offered, and then my cash flow doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it was just a big mess. And he said, is that typical? And I said, yeah, actually, it is typical. If we did it as a construction loan, we'd do the exact same thing. We'd do an as-will-be appraisal. We'd loan you 70% of that appraised value. But we have this tax lease program. So that's what we did. We wrote a tax lease. Even though we don't have the mortgage on the property, the bank has the mortgage. We put up this building. Well, actually, he built it, had it built, built to his specifications. His guys built the bridge crane. We paid them for the work that they did in the building. We pay all the invoices. At the end of the project, when it's completed, um, we sign the final lease documents. We take 85% of the cost. We spread it over 10 years. We apply an interest rate to it. The last 15% we set aside, it's a residual. It's almost like paying the, the down payment at the end of the term instead of at the beginning. No down payment. Um, the first payment isn't due until the building is put into service. And so, so he got the shop built and he never had to put, use any of his money for the down payment. He used it to put in equipment, new equipment inside the building instead. 
and this lease will be in place for 10 years and then he pays us off at the end and he owns the building. So if for something, a project this size, we only do what's called a fixture filing. It'd be just like if we loaned you money for a tractor, we do a UCC filing and say, we've got a, a security interest in that tractor. We have a security interest in this building. If it's a build, uh, bigger building, we'll do a severance and easement. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll do a severance and easement agreement where we sever the building from the real estate under it and then we enter into a contractual easement that says, if you don't make your lease payments, we can lease your building to somebody else and you can't keep them out. You have to let them come in and use the building. So, so I've been doing a lot of these. Um, I, I did one for a delivery vehicle for one of my small scale farmers in Illinois. Um, I did, a, I, I won't say what kind of business, but it was a food processing business. They had a really specialized piece of equipment they needed and they were having it custom built so we paid for that and we did that on a tax lease. Um, if he decides at some point that he wants, he doesn't want the lease in place anymore, he can actually pay off the lease, like refinance it. And he will have paid down some principal, even though it's not technically a lease to own, we track as the lease is paid off. And so, so he's not gonna have to pay the full amount, right? Yeah, the question is, um, does it have to be a new building or could you, could you buy a used piece of equipment or could you um, do retrofitting of a building, that sort of thing? Yeah, we can do all of that. Um, I've got a... Fixing a barn, that's Fixing a barn, yep, yep, absolutely. Um, I'm doing uh, an on-farm meat processing plant right now. So they're adding on to the barn. And um, I did the delivery vehicle I mentioned, that was actually a used vehicle that he bought. Um, yeah, so we can, do, we can do a lot of different things under this program. I've been writing a lot of these in the last few years because especially with specialized buildings or specialized equipment, getting the appraisal to, to or getting an appraisal that's gonna say that it's worth what you need to get the financing is really tough to do. So like an on-farm meat processing plant, it, it's gonna appraise at 30% of what it costs to build it, but we can do it under the tax lease. And in that case, he, he got a, uh, meat processors grant, so he's using the grant to fund part of the project that keeps the, the total lease amount down, which is totally fine. So, I actually, I financed that piece of equipment there too, that belongs to another Amish farmer, that's a, a soil shredder, screener shredder machine. In fact, I financed it, I never saw it. And I, I, I was thinking it was gonna be like a big grain cleaner, and then I was over visiting, visiting this client, and he had the thing sitting in his shop, like, oh my God, that is huge. You know, you're not dragging that around with horses. It's, that's, that is big, so. Um, then on programs, I just wanted to quickly mention this. I was gonna put a section in here on different cost sharing programs and stuff, but these guys are the experts. And I know Tom Manley is here. I think he's in the, in the trade show area. Stop and see Tom and ask him what sorts of, of assistance is available for organic producers. He is the expert. He knows everything. They've got this program, it's nationwide the top program, so, so I'm not even gonna say anymore, I, I, I am far from an expert on this, but talk to Tom. Okay, I think we're, Alyssa, how much time do we have for questions? This is a 30 minute break, so we can go a bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, any questions you have about anything, I'm happy to talk about. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, talking back about the, the farm credit crisis of the 80s, and have there been any novel practices put in place last couple of years to avoid it? Not really in the last couple of years. It was, it was a lot of that stuff that came out of the, the farm crisis. You know, it really, it shook people up, and a lot of things changed at that time. And there were a lot of creative things that happened at that time. Organic Valley was formed right after the farm crisis of the 80s, right? Because it would, and it started as a group of dairy farmers who got together to, to pool their milk and sell it as organic milk. Or no, excuse me, it was vegetable, vegetable producers. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm telling the wrong history here. A uh, group of organic vegetable producers got together, formed a pool to sell their vegetables, and some of them were dairy farmers. Then they started pooling their milk, and now the milk side of Organic Valley is huge, and the vegetables are a relatively minor piece. 
Now, there are a lot of things that came out of the farm crisis in the 80s. I wouldn't say there are anything, nothing too novel the last couple of years other than these non-regulated lenders, you know, um, in regenerative agriculture. I mean, it, I can't even keep up with how many new funds there are, and they're backed by investors and family offices, and um, yeah, they're, and they're run by smart people, really smart, sophisticated people. Um, but almost too sophisticated. You know, they come up with these really sophisticated models for financing when we've got a system that's worked pretty well for over 100 years with some wrinkles, obviously, along the way. But, um, yeah, and it's not, it doesn't have to be that complicated, you know. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So the comment was about um, someone who who financed land at five or six percent, and it's sort of a triple net lease where they're paying the property taxes, probably have to pay all the upkeep on the buildings and stuff too, I would guess. Um, and yet the financing company owns the farm, so they they have no risk. They're taking the appreciation in the value, and getting a cash return each year too from the rent or from the interest, I should say. Yes, sir. in the back there. Can you talk on some of the pros and cons of a land contract versus a commercial lending? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So the uh, question is pros and cons of a land contract versus conventional lending. Land contracts are great. Yeah, if you can enter into a land contract, typically the interest rate is going to be lower than our interest rate. Um, a lot of times the terms are, are going to be a bit more favorable. Uh, most, most land contracts are maybe set up for a five or seven year term with a balloon payment at the end. They'll typically be amortized over a longer time, 15 or 30 years. Um, but land contracts are fantastic. And we, we will do joint financing with a land contract, although we have to be in a first lien position, so in which that can be a, a bit of a challenge. The seller also has to have the ability, if they've got a mortgage on the property when they sell it to you, they have to have enough cash to pay off the mortgage and release the, the lien against it. But yeah, land contracts are, are a good way to go if you can enter into one. Again, usually the interest rate's gonna be lower. Sometimes we'll have someone that's been in a land contract, they build up some equity and then they, once they hit that balloon payment date, they'll come to us and we refinance the land contract. Yes, sir, yeah. Right. That doesn't, that doesn't carry over in, in land. And I know it would be onerous to have an appraised price attached to it. It's usually production of market cost. But it seems like it's kind of a, a system that's failing because it tends to attract speculators for a low cost investment. Yeah, so the question was about um, property taxes and use value assessment on property taxes. So. So if you, you've got a piece of agricultural land, it's, it's taxed at its agricultural use value rather than its market value, which can attract speculators because your property taxes can be pretty cheap. Um, and so the holding cost is low. They could buy it, they could sit on it for 10 years before they develop it, but there's, no, there's not a big disincentive for them to do that. Yeah, I think, it, I think it has skewed things a bit. And here in Wisconsin, if you look at, at use value assessment, the lowest use value is for pasture. Um, productive cropland might be 20 bucks an acre or something. Um, productive forest, if it's not connected to agricultural land, that might be 60 bucks an acre. I mean, they, the tax on forest land is really, really high. Even if it's ag, ag forest where it's connected to productive cropland, 
it's still going to be 30 bucks an acre when everything else is cheap. Yeah, I think it has really, really skewed the market. I don't know how much it's fueled speculation, but it, it could, and, it's, and it forces things to happen. Like people turn cattle into the woods, then it becomes pasture, right? And, but is that good? Is that, do we want that? You know? um, when I bought my land, it was considered, it was considered um, unused because I had, I had pasture that hadn't been used in many years. My taxes went way up. We fenced it. I wanted to turn it into a, into a managed grazing anyway. So we fenced it, and our property taxes dropped from 20 bucks an acre to a dollar an acre. I mean, it was that big of a difference for having it as pasture versus, um, versus un, I forget even what the classification was. It was like unused land, unproductive land, or something. I don't remember exactly the. In uh, Island Land in Kansas, and they called it wasteland. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. just wanted to give uh, Tom Ferrer a shout out, having worked out with you personally in the past, and so I can attest to. Yeah, just the flexibility of the financing, and uh, we were working with limited resource producers and under an RCPP, and it was a really great experience. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And so, secondly, uh, a shameless plug for Mad Agriculture. I'm here representing them, so if you want to talk anything capital or markets, uh, you can find me. Okay, great. Anything else? I'll be around for a little while too, so if you want to talk some more. Okay, thanks everybody for coming to this session. Appreciate it. Yeah.